question. So she was saying one, one good thing is to have seen the headlines beforehand. So she's seen all the headlines on day before. But I've seen all the headlines the day before, and I'm not on Twitter. And I know the headlines are telling you what the story is. Someone who's a journalist The problem with the journalist is that the journalist is written by somebody who's trying to market the news. Are we still have to engage in Google? And so you're going to Google the stuff that things that you might have to do in the future. So like in publishing, we have to keep making books because that's a lot of people prefer books. Well, there's a lot of stuff that... People talk about how fast the markets are changing and stuff, but when you look at what's actually going on, like we're supplementing. We're not replacing. We're not talking about destroying books. We're not talking about destroying television. Well, they destroyed the music industry. They didn't destroy the music industry. No, no, no. The music industry is They destroyed the newspapers. I was going to say newspapers are being destroyed. Newspapers are the biggest example of something that's actually really being revolutionized. But it's not being destroyed. Uh, the, 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 well, <laughs> it'll, it'll, certainly some careers are being destroyed, but... Well, we, we no longer publish in a hard copy well, because we could support it. Now, the, we're online, the media itself. But, the, but our target audience out west of here in Alberton and Superior, mm -hmm. about 75 to 80 percent of those people will not be the ones that are going to our website to get the news, and they have to be reached. So there is a major issue in this great new world if you're going to communicate the important facts, which is the purpose of your book. And I'll, you know, I'll, I'll try not to spend a whole lot of time on my soapbox. No, but, but this is a, an incredibly important thing, to, especially to my constituents, mm -hmm. the people that need to know that uh, the, the Well Baby Clinic is going to show up at the mm -hmm. town hall today and you can, you can have, a, have a session with the doctor. There's no so other way the, to get that the, news out there. What is the reason why the most people couldn't continue on? Who couldn't afford to lose twenty to thirty thousand dollars a year? Pretty much. Yeah. And there's so, only seven or eight thousand people out there. Right. And they don't have enough money to support it. I mean, we tried to have a corporation for public newspapers, which is a uh, not for profit, which would be similar to what public radio is, with memberships and clinics. And that works to a degree, it supports the website. Uh, it doesn't pay journalists to die. I go to meetings for free. So, so it's the devil's advocate. We just say that those 7,000 to 8,000 people are only going to be able to find out about the well baby clinic if they make the conscious effort to reach out. If they have an internet connection, if they can well, afford yeah, and, I mean, and some of them do. And some of it is, is getting the word out. Some of it we're um, trying to educate some people in community journalism and publishing and newsletter, which is mm -hmm. the next thing on the list, which will be distributed free just to our zip code, for instance. But you know, that doesn't really solve the problem. No, definitely. And there's no radio about that. Yeah, no, I, I, I did a, uh, every year I, I promote an event in Missoula. We do a thing with Craig and Al in the morning on uh, one of the local stations, and they're a part of Gap Broadcasting. We go in at 6.30. There's two guys in the radio station at that hour. They run seven radio stations. Um, they only are on air on two of them. The other five are on full auto. I mean, there's nobody there. So you think about the way that we used to transition news. I mean, if there was a fire somewhere on Mount Sentinel, you know, you'd call the local radio station, and they'd put the word out. There's nobody at the local radio station anymore. Or, or, the, or the, the wreck on... Or they're spilling Coors beer, and you can go pick some up. That happens, too. Maybe the answer is for radio. Build micro radio yeah, that was suggested to me the other day, actually, we're, we're looking into it. Uh, low power FM stations. But there are canyons and things out there, so, I mean, it, and it's line of sight with FM, so the chances of it reaching enough people to make a difference. There's 300 people who live in Alberton proper, and there's maybe another 400 that live in the zip code that's affected by Alberton. 
and it, you might reach a total uh, 400 radio stations, and, and how many of those would read or listen? And uh, you ever play post office or whatever it is, you tell somebody something, and then they tell something, you know, by the time it gets around to you again, it's a whole different deal. <laughs> and, and that's the way news carries in small communities. So there has to be a solution. I don't know that that's the topic. No, I didn't have it. I just had. I just threw it out there because our burning question as a business is, you know, where's where's publishing going? And a lot of the ways that it, it seems to be going, and it seems to potentially be going, doesn't seem to pay for a publisher. And whereas, well, and and publishers are becoming less and less. Yeah, also because a well, publisher used to do for you, they either don't do anymore, or you can do it yourself relatively easily and expensively. That's some people's argument, but yeah. our argument would be, would be, I would think, You are a publisher, right? So what is, right. The, what is the promotion? But the, the thing is, well, what's going to happen is more people self-publish, and I've read articles on this, too. Mm -hmm. There's more people self-publish, and they don't have an editor, and they don't have somebody who actually make, <laughs> make sure that what they do is marketable. When you when somebody reads something and it's crap, they won't blame the publisher. They won't they especially won't blame the publisher then. And they probably don't blame they'll blame the author. And then the author's brand brand will be ruined because they didn't we, and there, there's publishers. something to be said for the editor's role in the whole process. <laughs> Another set of eyes on and, so and having by the time somebody an author the, gets done with something, so having they're, they're, somebody in the business and being a niche publisher, okay. you know, we can look at something and say, oh yeah, there is a market for that. That is of value. We will help market it. And we do, you know, we advertise things and we yeah. do go to shows and we help sell the, people sell the books. And it goes under our brand. So as a niche publisher, I wouldn't, I wouldn't guess that you are having. We're not having as big a problem, yeah. but it's, you know, there's a decrease, yeah, because libraries have been budget. Well, I can tell you that even I work for the Forest Service in, a public, in the publications wing at an MTDC. Even our stuff is we're no longer doing a whole lot of stuff in print for our people. It's all going on our intro red web instead of the other. Um, and our publishing load has just dropped in the last two years from here to here. Well, that probably, I mean, because a lot of what you were doing was scientific abstracts and stuff like that. No. no? Uh, what, what we're doing is stuff that's both for the public and for the field. We're doing things that people are interested in. Um, 200 pages of books on um, things to do with horses, things to do with OHBs, and you know, you know, it's not necessarily. There, it's, yes, it's nonfiction, but it's stuff that is uh, applicable to a lot of stuff in the public as well as with the horses. So what we're what we're seeing, we're trying to keep on track of what's going on with the New York Times, you know, and some of that sort of stuff. We're, we're reading the articles, and what we're seeing is that a lot of people want to go to the iTunes model, where they um, will just pay for the little thing that they want. The newspapers are going to be um, being funded by the, the hits, and very few are going to be press related anymore. Um, the, the biggest issue seems to be how our um, Publishers going to be able to fund the the author and still get it back while still and, and recoup what they need if they don't have the hard copy model to go with it. Um, and those are all being hashed out right now. If you follow all the emails and the, and the articles, um, the there are two main models that seem to be working. And one is the iTunes, and the other one is the Amazon model, where Amazon. Um, is setting the prices, and the publishers have to capitulate if they want to be on that website. But iTunes is doing it the other way. It's the, yeah, they're doing the agency. Well, the other model yeah. that works is the niche, <coughs> where you're publishing something for, for a group of people that really want the thing that you make, and you can maybe only sell a thousand of them, but like, that's enough. If you haven't, like when you do a niche publication, like it's going to cost $60 or $120 for a book, People would be like, well, that's ridiculous, but if they're in the niche and they need it, then they'll buy it. Right, right. well, that's what textbooks, right. textbook well, it's, it, have done. It, it's also fascinating when Ann and I both work for the same company. He yeah. owns it. Um, <laughs> we uh, occasionally, well, often, will have a book that goes out of print, mm -hmm. and demand isn't sufficient to reprint it. Lothrop, for one. And um, 
you know, <laughs> you, you end up looking it up on Amazon a year after it goes out of, out of print, or six months after it goes out of print, and it's selling for three hundred dollars a copy. And you go, what the hell? We couldn't, we couldn't give these get, away. We couldn't give them away. You know, yeah. a year ago, and now they're, you know, so it's just like ah. Yeah, so yeah. Google is going to go ahead and scan it, and it'll be part of their thing. And uh, well, <laughs> it depends on who owns the copyright. Yeah, it, yeah. It, it, know. Ones that are still on copyright are, mm -hmm. uh, you know. Well, and, and so go on what you do is just yeah, announce that it's out of print, wait a year, and they charge three hundred bucks. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Wait, just hang on to it. Yeah. Yeah. If you doesn't know them, you can the other, the other thing about time. Amazon, <laughs> progressing to something like you know the iPad, or I mean, our books aren't really appropriate for the Kindle, most of them just because of they're so image reliant. Um, we still have, I mean, what, what I would call our target market, 80% of our users, want a book. Mm -hmm. I think, I think that, that probably the people who would want an electronic version of what we're doing right now is about the 20%. And you know, the whole marketing rule is you have to keep the 80% that you usually do business with happy, but it's like if we do all this stuff for the 20% to get a few more, you know, is it a, a little bit more business is it going to pay? And it's like, at what point does the, is that the tail wagging the dog or, you know, at, at what point do you have to make that switch? And that's the, the you know, the ticket. Well, if you if you can make the switch inexpensively without a huge pain in your ass, then you just make the switch and you don't think about it, you don't market it, you just let it be there. But I don't know. That's how it works in my in my business. I what's don't. Your, what's your business? I, well, I, I one of my businesses. I'm a musician, and so I sell CDs, and so I make my stuff available on iTunes. But I sell as a single on iTunes, and I make thirty cents. I sell the CD, physical CD. I ship it to someone. I make twelve dollars. Like that's <laughs> that's not. Like so, I don't. I'm not like, hey, buy my thing on iTunes. That, so I mean, that's yeah, we, but you put it on there because you know a thousand people do it. It's just money. Um, but yeah, you, you put it on there and you don't think about it. You don't talk about it. It's easy. You just do it. That's from. Yeah, if you, if you drive by Third Street, we've got this big warehouse that's full of this stuff called books. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have a warehouse full of CDs. Well, we can it's rent more, you space. It's more than <laughs> a garage. Can I the future of the book? I got a question. I don't think that's, the, that, that the future of the book is the, like the big philosophical question right now. Yeah. One of the things, the metaphor for the book is that you know the first book is very expensive. You go to the printer and he says, you know, we need a thousand. That's fifteen hundred dollars. But if you want ten thousand, that's sixteen hundred dollars. Yeah. <laughs> right. It seems to me that the issue is you, you need to pick the right amount for your original publication, but then you need to move to print on demand. Mm -hmm. and, and that's a great model, except for color books. And, and anything yeah. that has any color in it, and the and, or is really reliant on images. And the Roadside Geology series, which is the oh, main thing we know of, none of the print on demand publishers will print that to a quality that's acceptable, mm -hmm. that you can see the And geology. most of them were originally printed in two color. And, and most of them were printed in two color. You, and now they're just, in full color. And, all the, the ones you know, in the last four years. We do a lot of stuff with Ingram, with lightning source and stuff like that. They don't have the quality to yeah. do yeah. to do the well, salt shifting. Well, Ingram, Ingram actually, one of, one of the guys who works for Ingram told me that they could print at a much higher quality on their their print-on-demand machines than they do, but they are running them at such a Shoot. high volume that they don't. And so he readily acknowledges that most of the other print-on-demand producers manufacture a higher quality product than they do, but they have the advantage of having the connection to um, the wholesale Ingram's the largest book wholesaler in the country, um, and you know they they built this database, and, and that's what they're relying on, and they don't need the call. You know, I guess what I meant by what's the future of the book, not the book we know of, right? Right. Yeah. That's but the, what as the technology increases, what mm -hmm. kind of where the kids going to be reading? Well, I can speak to that just my 
audience is kids. I have uh, my brother is a young adult author, and we have a video blog together that has about 200,000 subscribers, and, and he's you know New York Times bestselling author every time the books come out, and and they buy the books, John Green, and and they you know they buy Twilight, and like let's let's be honest here, Twilight is the top selling book in America three years straight. It's not us buying those books, it's kids. <laughs> So I mean I, I don't I don't I mean people are, like to talk about you know the Kindle and the iPad revolutionizing publishing and you know it's probably going to revolutionize it a little bit but it's not the same as an i as a, what are they called? iPod it's not that that's not the level of revolutionizing we're going to be seeing people will be using those things in certain situations but books they're good you know they're really good at what they do and you know you drop it on the floor it doesn't matter you spill some coffee on it you get a new one. You take they don't it to the beach and get sand Yeah, they don't stores. cost five hundred dollars a piece. And I, <laughs> I mean, does it? Does yeah, anybody here problem. not love books? Well, you, I, mean, I love books, but I guess my feeling on this is that, uh, well, two things. One, I feel like when the technology, which is still very kind of early, basic. particularly yeah, particularly with yes. e-readers, but when they get a four-color process onto an e-reader with a really high resolution where you can take your, your full color books and everything to it and it's a really enjoyable experience on the same level and simultaneously then, and this is getting way down the road, but when they start getting a lot cheaper, I mean you can get you know a two, meg, or two gig MP3 player at Walmart for 20 bucks yeah. and you know several years ago an MP3 player of any variety was $500 um, but I think really what, what I see it boiling down to is uh, at some point, those extremely easy, light, my whole library, my pocket e-readers are going to be a much lower barrier to entry for everybody, kids, adults, grandmas, whoever. And I see it a lot like uh, the radio TV transition. Everybody's worried that TV was going to kill radio. And just to a large extent it did, but there's a portion of the market that radio serves that was never going to go away. And so it loses a lot of importance and sort of the, the keystone feature that it had. But it never goes away. It, it just transitions. Sort of, right. Yeah. And yeah, no, I, I, I drove days. a friend's truck the other day. Uh, and he listens to AM radio. And i got to confess, I don't listen to AM radio. And I was absolutely amazed when I got in his car and was in it for half an hour. It's like, wow, this is completely different than the AM radio of my youth. <laughs> uh, well, and I think, that, that, I think that, that that's we're trying to decide, you know, we've defined ourselves as book publishers, and I think almost everybody in the field has, for generations, and it's like now we're looking that we're not, but you know, we're publishers, and how are we, you know, I think we have to believe Maybe. that our content is special, that we're going to want it, that we need to deliver it somehow, and people are going to be willing to pay. Okay, mm -hmm. so maybe it's... Maybe maybe the future of publishers is to be marketers. They've, they've been marketers. Yeah, you are. Marketers. Yeah, okay. marketers. but to to define themselves to as marketers and to be defined as marketers. Because that's what essentially when we edit it, we're making it more palatable for the public. Yeah. We put it in a format that we have designed that we think is the best format so, so, that the public can utilize. I yeah. mean, the whole thing about publishing is essentially taking an intellectual product right. and making it marketing. Yeah. So if the if the packaging is the biggest change, maybe I that's think, not such a I think one of the fears for book publishers is is that you know they've been watching what's been going on with other parts of the print media industry like newspapers and magazines which work different and and there's there's a little bit of fear that we're sort of like the next in line. And yeah. some people um, say we're more like the music industry and it's going to be destroyed. And, and, and there's, there's, you know, I mean, if, if you're a professional journalist right now and you're still drawing a paycheck, <laughs> Good you're a rare beast indeed. I'm, 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 I'm surprised so you're looking at what's journalism next. schools, you know. <laughs> Did you have a comment, Wendy? Uh, oh, there was something that you, you, you were saying, we were talking and about pay. book publishers <laughs> being marketers and you talked about preparing the book so that it's marketable. That's a piece of marketing, but that's different from marketing the book. No, and but marketing is everything you do to a product 
to take it out and make it available to the public. So putting it in a package is marketing. Yeah, well, it, that's how point, I have to define it. It's a piece of marketing, but it's, I, 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 I think there's way more to it. And if you stop there, see, th I think this is one of the things that, that the book publishing industry has lost that used to be something that was one of the most valuable things that it, that it provided, which is book publishers used to market their books. And they are doing that less and less now. They're now publishing the books, and the author needs to do more and more of the promotion. And so why then, you know, that used to be one of the big advantages of having your book published by a publisher instead of self-published, was that they were going to then promote your book. Mm -hmm. If they're not now doing that, you that lost was, a that was, out of your edge, I think. That was for a very few authors that that worked for. That was authors that, you know, were a big, the majority of publishers were pretty much doing what we've always done. Mm -hmm. And that's what the majority of books that are published act like. Yeah. You know, you hear about people who, you know, their book was, you know, front list or mid list, or even the mid list. Small publishers never have that kind of money, never send anybody on an author tour. They might help people send up off, set up author tours, make some calls, they might, they might, you know, we go to shows, we try to sell the books, we're, we're doing more to market the whole, you know, we do We'll do a catalogs or web pages or something to help somebody market it. But the idea that people, you know, those big New York publishers, yes, they sent people out on tours. They're not doing it now. Yeah. They're acting more like what we did. Yeah. What we do. So now well, there's not maybe an advantage to go with a big yes. publisher. But this Some is what I heard. New York when publishing is in more trouble than, than, than each small publisher. Right. This is the sense. thought I had though when the comment was made, you know, that maybe that is the direction for book publishers to be moving to next to so as not to go the way of newspapers or whatever is is maybe to become marketers. And that doesn't necessarily mean doing it in the traditional way and sending no. authors out on book tours because now there's other ways to market things like the internet. There's lower cost, easier ways that don't involve you know, all that travel and expense and everything. There's other ways to do it. So, I don't know, it's just, I think it's something Helping, worth, helping your something authors set up blogs or talking on Yeah, you know, you, you know, there, a, a bunch of things are coming to my mind that could be done, like, you know, provide training for your authors to help them promote their books more effectively, because most of them don't have a clue how to do it. They go, they get their book published, and then they flounder. So you could provide that, you could help them. You could, uh, you could set up resources for them to do it. You could, um, uh, you know, offer as an additional service to, you know, that maybe they pay for, that you, you know, will do a certain amount of it for them, or and there's all kinds of ways yeah, that, that could work. And, and we could it's do something to explore. And we need to do a lot more. And it's, it's interesting, because we have authors that run the gamut, from ones that have their own website, and are on Facebook, and are giving talks and they go to presentations and they're paid to do this, you know, they're experts. Yeah. To this guy who I recently got the contract, or I sent him the author information form, and he sent it back to me and said, I will do nothing. <laughs> I am not interested in it at all. Don't expect me to do nothing, anything. <laughs> Writing this book has been one of the worst experiences. <laughs> I hate people. Don't make me go talk to them. <laughs> so did you Thank you very much. Go I said thank you for being honest. No, he, we've got his book. We're happy. I won't tell you which one it is. <laughs> it's coming out this fall, though. <laughs> so, so why shouldn't the, uh, the the previous author? Why shouldn't they just self-publish? The one, the one who's such the a good. The one who's got the platform. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, <coughs> if they were doing fiction, and they were able to do something like that, I would say go for it. If they were doing something like, if they wanted to do a roadside geology book, for one thing, well, yeah. Yeah. they no, can't. No, they're, 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 in your, they're in your... You know, the, one, they can't they really... Can't, one, one thing they, that... Maybe that, 2010, but maybe a year from now, you know. Well, maybe they can, they but can. do you know how hard it is to put one of those together? Our editors, I mean, we have a specific, for that series, for the roadside geology series, we have a specific in-house expertise in terms of editing and layout and all that mm -hmm. that no one person has. 
for that series and that series alone. That's why that series yeah. is our gold line. Yeah. That's a major issue with... And that's a good niche that you have because mm -hmm. they need you. Yeah. But, but for but some other books... But asking the question in a more general sense, you know... And for if it's a historic history book or some, something that's like more... less... Um, yeah, like that. I don't know. <laughs> maybe, maybe they will do more self-publishing like a lot of the big art, musical artists have gone out and just yeah. made their music. It used to be... 20 years ago, the, the, the barriers to entry into the market were if you didn't want your book to look like you came off your IBM Selectric, that you had to have somebody typeset it right. and lay it out. Right, and you don't and do that anymore. Apple, when they you know came along with desktop publishing, pretty much took that away as a concern, and um, people started self-publishing. And now the new barriers are, you know, it's it's not enough to have a website and sell your book on your website and have Amazon carry it. But because if you want to get into Barnes and Noble and if you want to get into the independent bookstores across the country and if you want to be carried by Ingram, they're not going to buy from you if you have one book. So the new barriers to mm -hmm. the market are probably just get access in the market. The other, the, the other argument is that from an author's point of view, if what you do well, is right or communicate, you know, that you want to get this information out there and you want to write. Yes, maybe you can do some marketing, maybe you're good at that, but anytime you do, you spend a lot of time doing that, you're not doing what you truly love or what you're truly good at, which is writing. When you're in your garage boxing up books, when you're, when you're, when you're selling, the publishers aren't doing that for you either. So, <laughs> no, but, but Richard, you had something to yeah. say. Yeah, yeah. Um, major issue to me in, in this whole transition is the fact checking that the editor did because yeah. once it's out there, yeah. if it's wrong, it mm -hmm. compounds and it compounds and it, and it just grows like the blob did in the 50s. It's and uh, <laughs> there is no way around that. No one is good enough to do it all themselves. Yeah. And if uh, mistakes in your facts or in your references or in your quotes is just absolutely inexcusable. Well, if it's hooked into social networking, you have a huge that's community true. of fact-checking. Well, that's, that's been a really interesting transition is the, the whole concept of a, of a wiki uh, and, and sort of crowdsourcing information and, and making that content, uh, you know, at what point that becomes Accurate. Yeah, People still true. need to have a lot of inaccuracy. Yeah, would you want to crowdsource a book on general relativity? <laughs> <laughs> people, people still need to be willing to go to Snopes and check and see whether that's a hoax or not. I've actually or not. I've <laughs> talked to people at Wikipedia, and and the people who are like the you know, people who work for Wikipedia, they said to me was, you know what Wikipedia is really good at fixing grammar, spelling, and and that stuff. Like, if there is a spelling mistake on Wikipedia, it's fixed. <laughs> but if there is, but if somebody put up that somebody won an Oscar in one year and they didn't win an Oscar, that that's just there forever. There is no. No, I mean it can be changed. It, I mean, it, no, it'll get it, it'll get fixed, but people don't notice it. Right, right. People notice the grammar mistakes. The crowdsourcing is really good at fixing your grammar. Yeah, it's not yeah. as good at fixing your sources. My question is, <laughs> is, it, is it fair to say every book's a website now? Mm. What's that one? Every book a website. By what do you mean? I it, it put the book in, and a website comes up, and it tells me about the author, it tells me about errors, it tells me about printing. It just it exists as a website, so it has a life. Um, you know, I think that's a question: is sense. is does every book is, is there a digital component to every book, or should there be? Um, and how do you? I find the whole question of how we're I, I, well, I guess I believe that it's not, media is not going to be either print or digital, but it's probably going to be both. Mm -hmm. Somebody mentioned radio t and killing, TV killing radio, right. and I don't think, you know, I don't think the internet is going to kill books or the iPad is going to kill the book. Or there's going to be but paperless they're, they're, offices. Right, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. 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 we all work at the paperless office. I live right? in a paperless yeah. office. There's no printer there. <laughs> um, and so I Googled it. And it came up on the spokesman review side as an op-ed piece. Yeah. 
which was a completely different <laughs> animal. And actually, the next day, there was a rebuttal to it from somebody. And you know, my concerns about it, it turned out, were valid. That the information was being promoted by somebody who had their own accident. And I, I, I was impressed what he was going to yeah. No worries. I, no, I have to stand up and um, get <laughs> <laughs> wave and wave a flag. Well, so regarding particularly like uh, local local news media, local culture media, sort of the, the newspapers and magazines going online. I work as the webmaster for NewWest.net, and so we do Missoula culture and news and whatnot, and we do a mix of professional journalism and a lot of community kind of source journalism, crowdsourced journalism. We do it with the Chronicle too. Absolutely. Oh yeah. Oh great. Um, and so, you know, a big part of, I guess, the, the switch in, in uh, outlook, at least for us, has been uh, when it comes to, to crowdsourced sort of journalism, then the job for us is curation, essentially. And so, to some extent, we take on the burden of fact-checking. If we're going to republish people's non-professionals' writing, then we take on a bit of the burden of the editorial and making sure that we're not just passing along bunk. Uh, but, you know, so in that sense, yeah, it's, it's the... The, you know, the journalist's job then sort of becomes picking and choosing the good stuff and the, the right sort of reflection of the community. And I think to some extent, I mean, I can see that extending to, to the book publishing world in the sense that uh, particularly if you look at, at more and more of your, your market share kind of moving to some kind of digital format, uh, people reading on their computers or on their whatever device, things like that, it seems to me that a book publisher can then sort of start to trade, particularly if you're a small one, on your, your niche status and your intimate knowledge of whatever field you tend to publish books in. And you can kind of bring users together because it's on an ebook, they've got a lower cost to buy one, two, or five of your books. And so if you can suggest to, your, to people who have bought one book, oh, hey, look, we, have, you know, we published this whole series on geology. And hey, since you bought one, you can have a little bit of a discount on getting a bunch of the others. And so you fight the sort of, I don't know, fight the loss of revenue with increased volume by linking people together with other stuff that they'd also be interested That's in. That's some of the things we're thinking about. But yeah, I, I wanted to do this because I, I was interested in getting some of the ideas and just to get a different, you know, microcosm of people together. Because we talk about this all amongst ourselves all the time. We have our own blind. <laughs> yeah. So what does the what does the roadside geology series do? Is it like actually you're driving? Oh yeah. It started, and it it started with a bunch of couple of geologists from here that they you know there's these road cuts and stuff around you know where you see rocks or glacial lake Missoula sediments and people would say well it'd be really interesting to know what I'm looking at well, as I drive if, down the road. What if it's on your iPad and your iPad has a GPS in it and it actually yeah. knows what you're looking at? Yeah, we've been working on that. Too. <laughs> every, every, you know, do you know how many times I hear that? And Our virtual reality. <laughs> All the pieces are out there. We have the quite done. The pieces are out there. It's a, the, the development isn't the, cheap. The pieces are out there, but the development is so expensive that I can't. Yeah. Make it pay, you know, yeah. well, ninety nine cents an app. Well, you, know, well, you don't do ninety nine cents. You do, you do ten or twenty dollar apps. Yeah, but it's still, and still they take out. I, and, yeah, and, and we, you know, and 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 our only our most recent books are in color. They have to be in color. Mm -hmm. We had somebody come to us who wanted to do one of those for the roadside geology of Minnesota. And if you look for for the iPhone, and if you look at that AT and T map. There's a problem in the middle of the country. Well, yeah. the GPS yeah. a problem in Montana. Yeah. The GPS yeah. works, but there's no three, you know, no AT and T three G there for, sure. for, and, for yeah. iPhones. And they wanted us to sort of foot the bill for the development of the app to the tune of about twenty thousand dollars. Yeah, so that's kind of they're, yeah. Always, they're always quoting me on no. those prices too. And twenty thousand is a whole lot of apps cheaper. you have to sell, yeah. and it's just not good. Yeah, it, wasn't it doesn't pencil out for you know. Well, that makes the assumption. It wasn't a horse I was going to bet on in the. <laughs> the running of the oh my goodness. Their stock is doing very well right now. <laughs> what about micro payments? Are, but, you know. What? Micro payments. iTunes, I think, is successful because you're you're off. Well, I, at like the App Store, you know, you, you know, you get diabetes buying ninety nine cent apps, but you buy them because ninety nine cents is hardly attractive. Right. And and I've always felt that the the web would come into its own when pico payments or micro payments would be such if you go to a website you love me leave a nickel we had a website if we'd bet 
if people left a nickel every time they visited, we'd be very wealthy people. <laughs> but nobody's developed a paint, you know, and, and I've had that discussion, but there's paint. They, two people have developed it, but it's been uh, capped. And it's by the credit card companies. In order for you, for the credit card companies to get their money, the, the transaction has to be $5 or it's not worth it. iTunes aggregates them and it charges you once you're over it. But th there was one called Peppercoin, which I thought was the most brilliant thing I'd ever seen. In fact, I brought it up to New West, and I was laughed at, saying, no, advertising is still the way to go. Advertising <laughs> is still the way to go. But I truly believe that that micropayment is key to the future, and that is, if you just want to acknowledge somebody that you liked what they did, and you leave them a nickel, how many hits do you get? About 400,000 a month. A nickel a hit, pretty wealthy guy. Penny, yeah. penny yeah. hit, quarter penny a hit. Twenty thousand bucks. I mean, see, that's why we cannot conceive of how work. the world has changed because we're all about making big money, making the big hit. Google, but it's all about the little micro payments collected. You know, and I thought, I mean, I thought that's ten years ago that, that that that's and PayPal is great, but it's like you you need to have something where it's easier for money to change hands on the internet. They for small amounts, right. the for small amounts of money. The difference and between no really zero and now. one cent well, is Google. the biggest difference of anything. Right. And, and the difference between you know one cent and, and twenty dollars is like nothing. Compared. Well, Google Pepper Coin, Pepper Coin, that was in England. When the coin, the smallest coin was a peppercorn. So mm -hmm. it was called Pepper Coin. And it was a brilliant one. Of the, it was a genius piece of work because it was all done by algorithm. In other words, you got paid based on an algorithm of this person's way they use the internet. So each transaction was not calculated. And don't tell me to explain it. It was voodoo, but it, it panned out. But I, I do think, and, and when iTunes and the App Store came up, I said, damn it, that's it, 99 cents? Well, it's going to be really interesting to watch this, what I think is probably going to be a bit of a coming turf war between Amazon and the various states. Right. South Carolina, etc., who are trying to collect sales tax sure. on Amazon sales. And when California really decides to collect it, that's going to be the big hammer. I think they'll legalize pot first. Yeah. <laughs> they'll cure all their budget woes. They have in California. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what, uh, when, you, when you mentioned yeah. micropayments, I was thinking also about you know something like roadside geology. Slicing and dicing. I don't want the whole Honey. Montana, but I want the roadway. Right. 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 And maybe you want to, and maybe you want to buy. And, and this is another. This was this was my idea of why I went to business school ten years ago. That I wanted to set up a website where you could buy like a chapter from a hiking guide and a chapter from a travel book and a chapter from the roadside geology, and it's sure. never really worked out, you know, it worked for iTunes, it worked for oh, iTunes but there's, there's, never, the there's never been a good way to integrate that, and that it's just not happened. Well, that was my vision 10 years ago. Well, we're just 10 years, you're probably, you're probably 12 years before you talk. Well, triple A will work just fine. Yeah, no, but that, that was what I wanted to do. I watched the whole thing with the tour Yellowstone Park on a cassette where you punched, you got it, you came to Yellowstone Park, Punch the number where you're at, told you what you're going to see on the right. Yeah, Tour information system. Right, and I watched that whole thing, and that was something to behold because Musselman did the software for it. Musselman and McHugh. Yeah, uh, it was ahead of its time, but I still, at that time, I always saw AAA, and AAA is more and more into this now. And I, I think it's when you, when you see the GPS units you can buy for your car, because they're in the iPhone and everything, they're driving so much, I'm sure you could sell your own GPS unit just for going through Montana. And it would tell you when you got to certain areas, the history, the geology, the dinosaurs below you, and the sky above They actually have those for Yellowstone. When you go on in Yellowstone, you can rent a GPS unit that will talk to you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And they had them for all, almost all, all the company that was doing it was developing it for all national parks and national monuments. And they sold it to a Canadian company Quite sure oh, they what, still going what happened after that. Well, I watched that. Uh, yeah, I have one of the prototypes. <laughs> you got the story of the prototype alone. Yeah. Their, no. their NASA engineer that was going to make it for them. It was, came out five pounds the size of a toaster. <laughs> so they had, to go, they had to go to Japan and buy a unit and pay 
what they paid for was a new case for it, but it was all, I think it had already been invented and made in Japan. Yeah, all the pieces were there, they just had trouble getting them all assembled. And they never did quite get the GPS in. Hands were too big, is that right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was, they were, you're correct, they were ahead of their time. They wanted to run in Superior now, that was one of these expeditions, Mineral County Challenge, was the Cedar Creek Loop, interpretive trail, Cedar Creek to Trout Creek, and they wanted to put together a CD for all the mining claims and all the things that were done there historically. And they want people to be able to buy it, put it in their CD player, or you know, put it in a DVD player or something while they're driving, and it will explain the uh, the elements that were there, and uh, you know, this why this this mine you know uh, was created at this and so a time, and it produced this much. I mean, they have a whole list of things that they want to do, but that your roadside geology thing, they think that because they were talking about it. They just finished this you know, kind of challenge uh, analysis. And what about it, it just a GPS that you know that you own in your car, but that that works like pay-per-view TV, where you know, like, oh, I'm driving down Route 90 in, in Montana now, and I want to know what I'm seeing right yeah. now, and you could actually pay to get that information on demand. Well, you can't you can't uh, text while you're driving, so how are you going to do it? <laughs> pull over. You're going to pull over. There'll be a voice command. Voice command. Voice command. Yeah. Yeah. Passenger seat. My phone doesn't know my voice well enough. <laughs> no, not yet, but that's, that's, all, that's all in process, too. Yeah. All, these the, the, yeah. all these things. Voice over here. Yeah, all these, you know, all this stuff. So location services is the name of the game here. And I think one of, the, one of the things, you know, I don't see it being GPS units in the sense that they're going the way of the dodo and it'll be your phone, because why would you break yeah. out a GPS unit? Um, but it is the case that publishing, whether you're doing uh, periodical type of publishing or books, anything where you're putting information out there, at least half the time, maybe 90%, who knows, your information has a home, has a location, a pair of GPS coordinates. Mm -hmm. And so my feeling has been for a lot of projects I'm involved with, kind of like you guys were running into the budgetary issues of it's really expensive right now to have your own software developed to handle all that stuff. At the same time, uh, no, like, no one's going to change the fact that GPS chips are coming into everybody's phone and everything else and that everything's going to, every gadget's going to know where it's at pretty soon. And so if you can just get, at this point, even um, start just tagging, getting that metadata in there with each bit of information you put out about whether it's, you know, with your book, just keeping track of the little coordinates for each of the places in it, uh, getting the coordinates for the location of your story into every story you publish online or something like that then um, when you can't afford to get on board with the geo, this like, you know, geolocation wagon, you don't face the additional expense of needing to go back to when you first thought of this and get that data into a bunch of old stuff when it's really cheap to keep it in there, particularly if you're doing like, uh, you know, news or, or things like that online. That's what my uh, Yeah, it's like, <laughs> you start, start amassing all that all that metadata about those locations now, when you can't afford to, you know, to pay for the, the development, it'll be worth so much more to you. And that's going to be the thing, is eventually you will be like rolling down the road and see some really cool thing and go, hey iPhone, tell me more about that right there. Mm -hmm. And then it, it'll be a go, you know, you, it won't subscribe to just your publisher's stream or just Google Maps or anything else, but it'll go hop out on the internet and do a search for this spot and say, what can you tell me about this spot? And hopefully it'll come up with a New West article about, you know, someone that, you know, conquered that mountain a year ago, or, you know, and it'll come up with some other data, hopefully from, you know, your, your books and whatnot. Uh, but if your, if your books and your other data don't have that information in there to be searched by location, then they're never gonna come up. Yeah, well, so. and, and the new generation of cameras that are out now, mm -hmm. yeah. um, log, log that information, yeah. Automatically, when you click the shutter. Are you going to give each one of our authors a yeah. tech camera? <laughs> well, Google will work with you. I mean, that's what Google's all about. They want to help you get into the software because they're visualizing the whole world. They're going to control the world. Yeah. But <laughs> and they're still, you still can work with them. I mean, they're oh, I'm, I'm, I want to work with them. <laughs> oh goodness, yeah, especially for your image. Yeah. So.
Mercedes aren't running very well. No, I have, I mean, they're all there. It's good to have people here. I just wanted to say one thing which has come up over and over again for me. And, and because I have a family back in the Midwest, a lot of the young people are with different political persuasion and they send me all this crap. <laughs> <laughs> and I finally, I finally, I have enough stats to say, okay, just a minute, let's agree on something. If, if, if you believe in facts, and I believe in facts, let's make a rule here. I'm not going to comment on anything until factcheck.com has commented on it. You read it, I read it, and then we can argue about it. You can tell me they're communists or whatever. And then all of a sudden, it is, what the hell's going on here? That used to be the role of the press. And then I realized when I got into working with the press, I'd send them press releases, and they'd print my press release, and it looked like they had written. Yeah. That's happening more and more now. It's yeah. disgusting. We need facts more than anything. We need credibility. And I'm all for some institution like Fact Check, where if I buy a book, I pay extra for a book that is certified. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, and I think that's actually part and parcel also tied to what we see going on in our political life today, where we have this absolute butting of heads and everybody is spending their time Why? So, well, dissing, dissing each other rather than working on some sort of solution. And it's, I think, goes back to the fact that I'll take my, I'll, you know, I'll bring my experts and you bring your experts, and nobody knows what's right. And, and you get, and you get main big figures who are able to Huge just lie, and they say you're li they're lying, and they just keep going on and doing it, and nothing happens. And One the of the big challenges is that once the lie is out there. Very, very hard to do damage control. Fact checking mm -hmm. is not that's, sufficient that's to erase the damage that the lie does and the spread that it continues to, to that continues to live on after the fact checking has come out. I don't think we should pretend like that's a new problem, though. Well, or, or to put it in the tech world, there was a, you know what was it yesterday? Steve Jobs, or the day before yesterday, he released this piece on why Apple wouldn't use Flash. And the next day, there was a big rebuttal to it from the CEO of, of uh, Adobe on, in the Wall Street Journal. And, you know, two completely separate stories. <laughs> and it's like, okay, who's telling the truth here? I, I mean, have the answer. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Yeah, yeah, I, we've had institutions like Consumers yeah. Report. If somebody ever tells me that's a phony operation, I'm dead. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, that, that's what we really need now is, is non-profit, non-partisan fact-checking or analysis. It, it's just we're desperate for it. 
Yeah. I learned about that in 1996. <laughs> <laughs> uh, filtering the digital din for your filtering readers. the digital. I like that. I, yeah. Uh, can I, I, like I that's, that's, that's a that's a book title. Digitally do. Yeah. Well, that's a book title. We can talk. <laughs> <laughs> if I didn't have ADD, it'd probably already be written. <laughs> Uh, probably need to be revised next week. <laughs> well, you know, uh, I'll just make it electronic. <laughs> I, I, I mean, I, I, I wrote about my son being able to build a broadcast system in 1995 that would rival, that could, he, and he could do it faster than I could. You know, for, for 2000 bucks, he could do on-site reporting anywhere in the world from the trunk of his car. And the only thing I said that Pride is the only thing that prohibits me from saying he could do it faster than I can. <laughs> you know, and and if nothing, it's come down in price since then. You can do it now with a with a digital camera like that and a digital audio recorder like I've got here. I can I can have it up on the web within minutes. You know, but who's to say? You may be, be getting tweeted about it right now. Yeah, well, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> but who's to say? Uh, attribution is essential, by the way. Um, so, You'll be on Flickr in 30 seconds. <laughs> so, back at you. <laughs> so, so who's to say that, that what I put up here is accurate? And, you know, there's no rules that say I can't take one little element of truth and put my opinion all over that. And because I have an element of truth, I can say it's valid. You're a politician. Go for it. No, I'm not a politician. <laughs> and there's a good reason for that, too. I am going to go interview a couple of politicians in a, in a couple of hours. But, you know, the, I guess another component of it is think back along the last couple of years of all the things that we found out about as they happened immediately that we wouldn't have had access to if it hadn't been for. Like the whole Iran, the yeah. Green Revolution. Yeah, yeah I, I call it the beast that's in Revelations, but I mean, I, I did, I'm not the one that gets to stop it. So, or, or the unfolding of some of these natural disasters in, you know, in front of our eyes. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not saying that there's not good things about that instantaneous communication, but you have to take it for what it is and say, this person was there, he saw that. But he doesn't have all the facts. He's like the guy that walks up and touches an elephant. The blind man says, "Well, it, you know, an elephant's really skinny. No, oh, it's got it's like a tree trunk, you know. You know, so I mean, you know, where do you, where do you, how do you put all those pieces together to make an accurate image? Well, you wait until somebody publishes a ten-page article in Harper's or Atlantic." <laughs> That's the irony. You don't know them. what's going on even watching TV. It takes a long, you know, it takes two months and somebody really writing to get all the nuance. And then my problem is that's where I go, but I've already been cluttered with. Well, I saw it on TV. So I mean, I was it. watching Katrina as it developed. You don't see it, and I couldn't mind. figure out how all those people could be there with those cameras, <laughs> watching people die, yeah, and there wasn't a trail behind them that somebody could, you know, have a. Six by six truck with some water in it. I mean, yeah. No. Well, I, I one, of, one, of, one of the stories that, that came out of uh, one of the one of the earthquakes in San Francisco a few years ago about a, a guy, right? Yeah, San Francisco. The, the day that the uh, bridge fell, um, a guy whose power was out in his building, and he used the the light from his his uh, his power board to get downstairs and he sat on the edge of the sidewalk and started entering his story um, in the dark. <laughs> there were people that were trapped underground couldn't get out and they were sending text messages with their cell phones so that they could guide somebody to find them. I mean, there, there's purposes for this stuff. It's just my, my question is, how I need to be honest to my readers. And, and so I have to go check the facts on this if I'm going to re repeat it. And yet the big the news station would come out during a, an incident in Alberton, and they interviewed kids without parental permission and broadcast it on television. And it, I mean, that's a no-no. Your puppy's dead. How do you feel? <laughs> well, no, it was they take him up to the top of the bus. You know what was the what was the issue? You know, and you know. For one thing, it, you know, it, you're not supposed to quote a teenager in 
put their face on television if the parents aren't there giving you permission. And they didn't go look for oh, the other side. Oh, is there somebody else supposed to be in the spot, huh? Yeah. We are going to start. Yes. Yes. So I don't know if we need this now because we're a smaller circle, um, but for people who might. So we're going to... Hello? Okay. <laughs> so this is a, an opportunity for us to kind of look back at the day, um, share any things that were of value with, with each other, um, give everyone a chance who wants to, to say a few words. Um, and just uh, when you get the, the, the mic, um, and actually we could possibly just pass this mic, I think that's what we'll do, or just pass this mic around. Just uh, remember that you got, uh, you got a, a, the floor, and for people to respect that, and also to respect um, everyone else that just share something that would be of value. And that's about it. I just want to close up. Uh, a couple items here. So, um, Missoula Bar Camp is going to have ripples and effects, and the best way that those can be maintained is if you enter your notes into the into the website, Twitter about this, blog about it, um, use the hashtags. There were elements in the in the program about that, and I'm sure we'll, we'll put up a note about that too on the website. And the website is our vehicle of choice. So I really grateful for all the amazing sessions I saw and I wish I could have attended more of them. So I, I really hope people will file their notes and video or audio or anything else they did. Does anyone want to start? Hi, Mary. I'll do it. I'll do it since I was supposed to talk before I did. You're a proud Also, thank you to Harold and to the park.
keep up on, and I, I bless you all for that. We had some great connections here. I, uh, I hope to be back uh, doing one thing or another, and uh, I feel like a, an honorary Missoulin today, so thanks so much for uh, welcoming me into your community. It's a wonderful, wonderful community you have here, and I'm so excited for what you're creating here, and I'm just really eager to see what you do with it from here. And thanks for having me here. some really cool new technology implementation and I go to my wife and I say, honey, you won't believe what I did. She'll look at me with those glazed eyes and go, oh, really? Okay. <laughs> and that doesn't happen here because there's actually technology people and people that understand <laughs> what I'm doing, what I'm working on. And so it's a great connection. It's a great way to, to build with people and to bounce ideas off and, and uh, it, it's been a fantastic day. My wife calls it blickety blick blick blick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's uh, been great, uh, great session. It's my second mark, and I've been looking forward to it since the last one. And as the, in the last one, I came out inspired, so thanks for everybody for sharing. I'd like to, uh, first of all, again, thank the people who put this together. A tremendous amount of effort went into it, and uh, without that effort, Folks, last year's was excellent. This year's was even better. What a great thing for Missoula! Thank you. Well, thank you very much. It was an awesome day today, and it was great meeting so many new people. And I think it's just a really exciting time to be in Missoula and involved in technology right now.
get my call prototype done, but it crashed this morning. So. <laughs> what I mean by that is I wish I could have met more people who had gone to more sessions. And I kind of uh, didn't go to the geek side. I stayed on the other side. And I want to you know, hear what's going on in jQuery thing, <laughs> HTML5, what's going on there. Um, but uh, I hope that we all get to <coughs> sort of explore each other a little more from the website. So let's keep uh, twittering and emailing and, and introducing ourselves to each other. Given the information that was out there, it was sort of hard to, you know, know what to expect. Um, I gotta say, I enjoyed it a lot. I, I am not. I, I consider myself a technology user, not necessarily uh, a geek. <laughs> um, and uh, I think one of the most valuable things that I got out of today was the opportunity to connect with some people and uh, some resources that. It constantly amazes me the caliber of people that we have in this community and uh, the people that are out there that you just don't always know are there. Um, and also, I think the big thing is community. And it's great to have this personal one-on-one -on -one and group connectivity in a place like this. So I thank you for offering that.
they being the first people that I approached with this idea uh, over two years ago, or the first of three. Um, I also want to thank uh, Nathan and, and Jennifer especially. The help that they provided last year um, made it be much more than I could have possibly imagined and, or, or made possible this year. And I actually bought them a bit this year to make it a bit smaller. And I'm glad that, that, uh, that they stood up for that, uh, for that bigger vision earlier than I had, had imagined. And that we, we went for this space. It cost a bit more than I, I was comfortable with. Uh, and I want to thank them for putting their um, Montana Web Designers and Developers Association as being the financially liable uh, organization. That was, a, that was a very courageous step. But it seemed to them they weren't being courageous at all. They just knew it was all going to be awesome. <laughs> and it was. I was just amazed. All these people kept saying, yes, you should take more money from us. <laughs> um, and for the work that they did for the food. Um, Andy Lakin is not here physically, but he's very present here for me um, through the website uh, that, he, um, that he really stood for. And he said, we should do this. And he found this awesome thing that we were able to build up upon and put a huge amount of work on it. And um, Seth Martin and Scott Rouse, who were here, who were here um, did, did a huge amount of work. And I don't think this would have been as successful if it hadn't been for their work. And I could go on. I'm sure I'm missing some people. But uh, I have to say thank you to all the sponsors, which are Legion. And I won't bore you with listing them again. But you can see them all over the place. Um, and some of those are, are yeah, they're on the t-shirts and they're on the signs and they're on the website, but support them and, and uh, keep them. So, and again, thank you. Thank you everyone for just coming because I don't care how much support we had for making this. If you didn't show up, it would not have been worth anything. So thank you for coming.
everybody else, just thrilled and excited about what every single one of us does and contributes to the community, and perhaps even more excited about what we are doing together in this community. And I thank everyone for that. Um, it's so exciting and inspiring. Thank you all. So for me, the best thing about Go Camp this year is I'm actually leaving with a longer to-do list than I can with. <laughs> stuff that I'm excited to do. Yeah. And honey, I have some for you too. Thank you. 
Our camp is just really cool. And thanks, Harold and Jennifer and Nathan. Um, Jennifer and Nathan and I, we've been talking about doing a statewide, I'm kind of like a cat out of bed, maybe a little prematurely here, but we're talking about maybe doing a statewide um, kind of a bar camp weekend. Uh, so we're in the planning of that, like next June, maybe doing like a three day, <coughs> cool camping slash tech, whatever. So anyway, it's just, it's just a lot of times I, I go in these groups and there's just not enough time. I mean, it's like, crap, the hours are over, you know, and we're just getting started. So um, it'd be cool to have a little more time to develop the ideas and the relationships and whatnot. So um, I look forward to working with you guys. And uh, at, some of you may not know, I'm, I started Montana Programmers about a year ago. And the whole idea is the same kind of concept as our camp. It's just uh, meeting people um, and, and mentoring people and being mentored by them. And uh, a lot of you guys have met through it, and there's a lot of and gals, an amazing group of people. Um, and if you're if you're at all interested in coding or tech stuff, check out MontanaProgrammers.com. Um, there's an amazing group of people to learn from, and they're so willing. And they'll take the time to sit there and explain something, even as rock headed as I am. Four or five times, about the sixth time, I finally get it. <laughs> and, uh, but yeah, it's just the patience and the, and the love and the, and the relationships are so cool. So thank you. Another awesome partner.
just weren't quite ready to go back in. Um, just an amazing experience. Thanks for coming and making it.
the market today. I was still a little bit skeptical. I thought, you know, what is this going to be like here in Zula? And I love Zula and I love people in Zula. But I thought, I still don't really understand what bar camp is, even being on the planning committee. And I thought, I have to admit that. But I came and I had a wonderful time. It was really incredible. I met some great people and all that. For those of you I didn't meet, I'm, I'm a little shy. I apologize. I, I don't go out of my box a lot to introduce some people like I should. So um, I'm sorry I didn't meet you if I didn't meet you in person. But um, that's all. all